Hey everyone, welcome to another XCOM 2 War of the Chosen challenge run. It's a new year and I've decided to start a new series on the channel. We're going to go through every single class in the Long War 2 mod and we're going to complete a solo class run with them. Now for those who don't know, Long War 2 was a total overhaul mod developed for XCOM 2. The original developers of the mod have moved on to making their own game, I think it's called Terra Invicta. But other modders have taken it upon themselves to make the overhaul compatible with War of the Chosen, which is really cool. Now, just to be clear, I'm not actually playing Long War itself. We're just taking the Long War classes and weapons, inserting them into the regular game and seeing how they fare. And this is all possible thanks to the mod author Favoured. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Now I know this idea probably isn't what you wanted, Headbanger, but hopefully it's a good start. And I'm thinking if I have a good understanding of how these classes work, when I do eventually play Long War, it'll give me an edge. And let's face it, I'm going to need every advantage I can get when I play that mod. Long War 2 is really difficult. Now there's 8 classes available to us. My plan is to complete a solo run with all of them before the end of 2023. So 8 classes, 11 months, it should be plenty of time. And I believe there are also overhauls to the Hero and Spark classes, so I'm open to doing runs with those as well, but I'm not entirely sure about it. They may be too similar to the original runs of those classes. So I guess we'll just see how we go. If enough people want me to try the overhauled classes, I'm definitely open to the possibility. As for today's video, I'm specifically looking at the Assault class. They have quite a few similarities with the Assault class from Enemy Within, the previous XCOM game. They're focused on getting in close range. They can equip a shotgun, a rifle, or an SMG, and we'll talk about SMGs later in the video as their primary weapon, and they have an arc thrower as their secondary. The arc thrower is used to stun enemies. And this class has three skill branches in the skill tree, and I'm pretty sure that's the case for all of the Long War 2 classes. Now the first branch in the tree is the Raider branch. It focuses on offensive abilities with the shotgun. The Disable branch specializes in upgrading the Arc Thrower. And finally, the Breacher branch can increase your soldier's survivability. And the reason I've decided to start with this class is because I'm expecting it to be one of the easier ones to use. These guys can be quite powerful, so it should be a good introductory run for me. And some of the other classes that we'll use as we go are going to be much more difficult. And as for the rules, they're pretty standard today. We're playing on Commander Difficulty, we're playing on Honest Man, and we're only using the Long War 2 Assault class in combat. And you'll see on the footage here that every squaddy starts with run and gun, and yeah, that's as OP as it sounds. Especially for my aggressive and impatient playstyle, I really couldn't ask for a better starting ability. Now we do get a bad pot activation on Gatecrasher with all six enemies triggering at the same time. And this really happened because I wasn't paying close enough attention. Now we do take some damage because of this. I mean, it's going to be impossible for us to take out six guys at one time on the first mission, but thankfully everyone does survive, so it's not too big of a deal. Now I did use the starting soldiers mod to begin with 13 assault troopers. I used to begin these runs with 12 soldiers, but the vanilla game, without the starting soldiers mod that is, actually gives me 13. Now I think the 13th is only added with the Resistance Warrior DLC, but the point of these runs is to keep the game as close to vanilla as possible. And since I own that DLC, and I start with 13 troops in a regular run, I'm going to start these runs with 13 troops from now on. So I'm just giving myself one extra. And doing that would have made some of the earlier campaigns, like the PsyOps and the Hero Class runs, a bit easier. But hey, you live and learn. Nothing we can do about that now. So I go with Modular Weapons as our first research, and as soon as it completes, we get a breakthrough for Improved Conventional Weapon Damage. This means our shotguns will be doing a minimum of 5 damage when they hit. I could not have asked for better luck this early into the game. This is going to give us a huge advantage right off the bat. 
So with all these things working in our favor, as you'd expect, the first Gorilla Op is pretty easy, so I won't go into detail about it, but we do gain our first promotion. There's three abilities we have to choose from. The first is Slug Shot, which can only be used with the shotgun. It pierces two armor, and it has no range penalties. A really awesome ability, especially given our options for shredding are going to be somewhat limited in this run. Electroshock causes disorientation on your opponents when the arc thrower misses. So you can go for the stun, and even if the shot doesn't connect, you're guaranteed to disorient. I always struggle pronouncing that word. Whatever. Now, this is useful as the default aim for the arc thrower is pretty bad, so that's a nice buff to have. And the final ability is lightning reflexes. But this one works differently to the vanilla perk of the same name. With this version, all enemy overwatch shots have a decreased chance to hit, but the bonus does go down with each reaction shot that we run. So this can protect us against multiple overwatches, not just the first one. Now our soldiers will get hidden perks as well, and they're all taken from Long War 2 as far as I can tell, but I'll focus on those when we choose them. Up next we have the usual Horde mission, but it's pretty uneventful, so we're just going to go straight to the Retaliation mission. And we get a blast of nostalgia as the Warlock is the first chosen to arrive. It's been a while since that happened. His strengths are Blast, Shield, and Shadow Step. His weakness is Groundling. And we do get into a bit of trouble on this one, possibly the first time in the campaign. Lake panics from a sectoid. While the squad is sandwiched between the sectoid, a trooper, and a faceless. Now thanks to run and gun, we can one-shot the trooper at point-blank range. I then send the other two soldiers after the faceless. With the trooper down, the sectoid should just try to raise a zombie so it's not too much of a threat. The faceless is definitely the thing we need to focus on first. And our conventional weapon upgrade proves really clutch here. Both shots on the faceless roll minimum damage. Now without that plus one from the research, this thing would have survived and been able to attack us. But as it stands, minimum damage, that's 5 HP per shot, is all that we need. Now just like I suspected, the sectoid raises a zombie, but it actually opts for a civilian over the trooper. I guess maybe it was trying to torment us by forcing us to take out a civilian? <laughs> yeah, you came to the wrong video, sectoid. That's not going to bother us on this channel. So we take this thing out easily. So we push on, and soon the warlock has taken cover next to some explosives. Now normally that would be great, but of course Blast Shield will mean he takes no damage when we detonate those explosives. So that part kind of sucks, but when we blow it up it will still shred, and it'll still remove his cover. So we do still get some advantages. Voldra and Lake then make a couple of 80% shots, and they roll big damage too. This causes the Warlock to flee into his safety bubble, but this early into the campaign, he only summons a single Spectral Lancer to protect him. Now that's not going to do much. We can take that thing down pretty easily, then we can continue going after the Warlock, and it only takes a single shot more to fell the Great Talky one. So yeah, the troops were pretty beastly here. This team not only wiped out the Warlock in three shots, they actually didn't miss a single shot in the entire mission. They had 100% accuracy. That doesn't happen too often. The Warlock really never had a chance on this one. But our good luck isn't done just yet. Things are about to get even better. We get the first Council Supply Drop, which means we can assign a Resistance Order. And the first two perks we have to choose from are Guardian Angels and Infiltrate. Now these are the two best abilities that the Reapers have to offer. I was elated about this. So I opt to take Guardian Angels because any campaign with zero ambush missions is a good campaign in my book, so I want to grab that one right now. But I also want to grab Infiltrate as quick as we can. That one will be really useful too. And then we have a Covert Op that will let us reuse weapon mods, so that's another really awesome bonus to pick up. On the next Gorilla Op, we again get sandwiched between two pods. That seems to be happening a lot in this run. Now the pods themselves are easy enough to deal with, so we're not in too much danger, but Valdra does take a stasis from the priest. So she kind of gets left behind from the rest of the squad, 
and not to mention we had a turret to deal with earlier, so we're running really low on time before the objective expires. I move Moby in to get the hack on the last possible turn, but while he's doing that, we've also got reinforcements dropping in on us. We just can't catch a break this mission. Between the regular enemies, the reinforcements, and the turret, that's 10 opponents for us to take out on this mission. We're still fielding only four soldiers. So the reinforcements come and two troopers and a captain quite literally rain down on our parade. Now the troopers are easy enough to finish off, but the captain is just too far away and he's in full cover. Not to mention we also have two of our run and guns on cooldown. So we just can't get in close enough and it's very unlikely we're going to be able to defeat him this turn. So instead I opt for a flashbang. I'm hoping that will handicap him enough that he won't be much of a threat. But um, spoiler alert, it turns out I'm wrong. This captain climbs up on the roof, he lines a shot at Jan and one shots him with a crit. Not bleed out either, just instant death. Jan is gone. I couldn't believe this happened. Now we have had pretty good RNG this run, so I wasn't too mad about it. It was just really unexpected. I hate to think how astronomically small the chances of that happening were, but it just happened. This is really brutal, our first casualty. Unless... Yeah, thanks to the recruitment pool double up glitch, Jan is back like and nothing ever happened, and this was really cool. See, my character pool is so large these days that we rarely get double ups of anyone anymore. But the only guy in the entire pool who was duplicated is the one guy we need. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Now his intelligence is lower than the original Jan and that kind of sucks, but it's still good to have him back. Maybe he suffered some slight brain damage from his otherwise fatal wound. Anyway, whatever the case, welcome back to the team buddy. As soon as we have the GTS built, we're going to train you up. Also, after this mission, we get our first sergeant. At this rank, our ability is a trench gun, which is kind of like saturation fire. It can hit multiple enemies in a cone. Arc Pulsar allows the arc thrower to affect mechanical enemies, which is pretty good. And the final perk is close and personal, which gives you a plus 30% crit chance on adjacent enemies. So that could be really good too. I decide to go for Trench Gun just to try it out. And pretty soon it's time for the first Supply Raid, and we have a real double-edged sword here. The Savage Sit Rep is active, so that means this mission will be full of Faceless. Now if we can win, we'll get a huge leg up by having early access to multiple Mimic Beacons. But the catch is that winning is going to be really difficult. Especially because, like I said, the GTS is still under construction, so we're limited to four soldiers. In retrospect, I probably should have built the GTS before the resistance ring, but too late to change things now. The reason I didn't is because I figured these soldiers would be strong enough even without the benefits of the GTS. I guess we'll find out if I was right. Now I do decide to bring two flashbangs, as these can assist greatly in slowing down the faceless. And then we set off. Things start off with one Lancer and one Faceless. And I've got to show you something really cool here. We've given Moby the close and personal perk, as well as a laser sight on his shotgun. So if he can flank an adjacent target, his crit chance goes up to... Well... <laughs> yeah, he's pretty powerful. So needless to say, the Stun Lancer doesn't stand much of a chance. So we move forward and the next pod is a Stun Lancer and two Faceless, so things are ramping up. Now Malorian lands a clutch crit to one-shot the Stun Lancer, and this is really, really good. However, what is far less good is that both Moby and Andro miss their respective shots on the Faceless. After the crit on the Stun Lancer, I was hoping we'd be able to take one down, so that would only leave one left to deal with, but not the case. RNG giveth and taketh away, as we know. So instead we just have to flashbang both of the Faceless. This is going to reduce their movement, so they shouldn't be able to reach us. And even if they do reach us, it's going to lower their accuracy, so they should miss with their attack. And given their melee only units, flashbangs are a really good option for these guys. 
The problem is that another three of them activate on the enemy turn, so now we have five of these things to deal with at once. That's 50 points of HP. This is a bad situation. Now Moby redeems himself after last turn, and he connects with a huge crit for 10 damage, and he one-shots a Faceless. That is insane. This allows us to eliminate the first two of the Faceless, and then we can flashbang the three new arrivals. Now it is looking very likely that we're going to take some damage. We only had two flashbangs, so now we're out, and it's unlikely we're going to be able to finish all three of them on this turn. I'm hoping we can take out at least two, and then we'll just need to tank a hit from a single faceless. However, sadly Lake misses an 83% shot, and this causes two of the faceless to survive. And even though 83% may sound good on paper, eventually when you take enough shots, you're going to get that 1 in 5 chance of a miss. So Malorian gets hit, but he survives. Lake, however, is not so lucky. She takes a crit, and once again we lose a soldier to a one-shot. This campaign is like a roller coaster, just ups and downs all the way. Now I could have moved in closer to the Faceless and given myself a 100% chance to hit, but when it comes to Faceless, you want as much distance between yourself and them as possible. I figured the further away I was, the more difficult it would be for the surviving Faceless to reach our troops. So I took a risk and it, unfortunately, did not pay off. Now the good news is the remaining three troops are able to mop up the last of the bad guys pretty easily, and that means that we're now swimming in faceless corpses. That means mimic beacons for us. And sadly, there's no lake clone in the recruitment pool. She's just gone. That hurts. I spend some intel for supplies so we can build our three Mimic Beacons, and we also just unlocked Magnetic Weapons, so I want to buy those two when we can afford them. And sure enough, by the next Guerrilla Op, we have five soldiers, we have Magnetic Shotguns and SMGs, as well as carrying two Mimic Beacons. So yeah, we've gotten quite a few upgrades, this is going to make quite the difference on the tactical layer. Now I didn't bring the third Mimic Beacon since we still want a Medikit and a Flashbang, but once we get played at armor, that won't be a problem anymore. So I test out Trench Gun with Valdra on this mission, but it's just as I feared. The range on this ability is pretty small, so it's going to be very situational when it's actually useful. And while we're here, let's also discuss the SMG. I think it's a good time to do that. This is a weapon that was added with Long War 2. It does less damage than a rifle, but it does provide a mobility bonus in exchange for that. And on top of that, have a look at this. See how Valdra will be detected if she moves onto this tile? Well, Andro won't. And the reason is because Andro has an SMG. This weapon also reduces the detection radius of enemies when you're carrying it. And you'll also see here that it's doing a minimum of 5 damage. I think it's benefiting from the plus 1 damage on our rifles that we obtained as breakthrough research earlier. I didn't mention that, but we did grab it along the way. So this thing is a pretty good little weapon for us to have. It's got some unique benefits, and it's usually worth equipping it on at least one person on the squad. Now I run Bismarck out to finish the Viper, but here's the risk you take when you use run and gun. You move too far out, and there's a good chance another pod will be waiting for you. This is like the Templar run all over again. Now it's a good thing we got those Mimic Beacons when we did, otherwise we would be in huge trouble right now, and we'd be looking at losing a soldier. And the Mimic Beacons are why I was comfortable being this aggressive. And check out Slugshot, this is an awesome ability for mechs. It ignores two armor points, so you're still doing full damage to these things. If we can combine this perk with blue screen rounds, there's going to be a lot of dead robots in our wake. I'm excited about that. Now, as we proceed, the Warlock reveals himself he's on this mission, and we actually activate him and the Field Commander we have to eliminate at pretty much the same time. And what's more annoying is that this mission has the sit rep that places explosive containers all over the map. 
Now, normally that would be really useful for us, but because the Warlock has Blast Shield, he doesn't have to worry about those explosive containers. He can position himself wherever he wants. We don't have that luxury. I focus on taking out the remaining troopers and then using the Mimic Beacon on the Field Commander. These enemies just have way too much HP for us to be able to finish them all in one turn. Now unfortunately, my plan means that we're giving the Warlock the chance to mind control Bismarck. And it's highly unlikely we'll be able to finish the Warlock on our next turn, so things are looking pretty dire here. I send a Drifter in for the Commander, and I'm really hoping for some big damage rolls here. If we can two-shot this guy, we may have a chance of surviving. Okay, never mind about two-shotting. A one-shot will do just fine. That's perfect, in fact. Now, a grenade on the Warlock will cause fall damage and shred him, even if it doesn't do any damage directly. And then I opt to flashbang Bismarck. This is going to lower his aim, and it'll hopefully stop him from being able to harm any of our troops. Then again, that's what I thought about the Captain, who one-shot Jan, and it didn't end too well there. So, phew, it's alright. Bismarck misses. No harm done. Excellent. The Warlock charges forward to regain line of sight on us, and he actually catches fire, which is pretty good. Now he goes for a Mind Scorch on Drifter, but our boy just kind of ignores it. Like the game doesn't even say the attempt failed. It's just like it never happened. Drifter is going beast mode in this mission. Now I haven't actually been using him too much on this run, so maybe he's trying to earn his way back onto the team. You're doing a good job, keep it up. Now, of course, the Warlock moving towards us means that we now have him in... Close range. Yeah, I'm probably going to overuse that meme by a huge amount in this video. I mean, it's what the assaults are built for. How can I pass up the opportunity? So I hope you don't get too sick of it. Anyway, the shotgun crew hand out the crits, and once again, the Warlock is banished to the Shadow Realm. Things did get a bit dicey there, but we persevered, no harm done. And soon after this mission, we complete plated armor research, and I decide now is the time to hit the black site. We can carry two utility items per soldier, that means we can load up on mimic beacons while not sacrificing on the grenade front. This is exactly what we need. And I should mention it here, I believe in Long War 2, you can equip a pistol as a utility item rather than a secondary weapon. The author of the mod that I'm using stated they deliberately left this feature out of the mod as a design choice. So we're not going to be able to use pistols. Now it's no big deal here for our assaults, they really don't need pistols. But when we get around to doing the Long War 2 sharpshooter class, well, God help me. Alright, so we've arrived at the black site, and check out what Slugshot can do to turrets now that we have mag weapons. It's pretty incredible, they're an easy one shot for us. Then we have a Spectral Zombie, a Mech, and a Muton to deal with all at once. Now I was hoping to complete this mission before Mutons activated, that's why I wanted to do it so early, but I was too slow. And things get even worse when I move Chainsaw Turkey, I really love that name for the record, I move him out, and in so doing this, we activate a Captain and a Purifier too. So by my count, that's five enemies to deal with all at once. So once again, I'm glad we have those Mimic Beacons. We're gonna need them. I try out Andro's upgraded Arc Pulsar on the mech. Initially, I'm disappointed because it only stuns for a single action, not the whole turn. But when the mech instantly drops dead, that disappointment evaporates pretty quickly. I didn't realize the Arc Pulsar did physical damage on top of the stun, but it does. I'm not sure if it's only on mechanical enemies, I'll have to test that out, but this is really cool. Now the Captain and the Muton are both going to survive this turn. I could have run out to eliminate the Muton, but I didn't want to risk activating another pod. So instead I go for a Mimic Beacon, and the challenge here is throwing it somewhere that is in both enemies' line of sight. And despite my best efforts, I fail at doing this and the Muton completely ignores the beacon. Now, I was terrified we were going to get a grenade here, but thankfully it only goes for suppression. So no damage inflicted, we're okay. I used the Skulljack with Melorian and now we have a Codex. 
Now, it might be too early to activate these things as we don't have blue screen rounds yet, but being the impatient man that I am, I decide we're gonna go for it. We burn through another Mimic Beacon on the Muton and the Codex, and then on the next turn, we finally eliminate them both. This Muton's been hanging around for a while. And then we can regroup and push forward to the main structure and continue with the mission. Inside the building, we have a Spectral Active as well as the usual pod of a mech and two troopers. And thanks to Andro missing a 95% shot, I'm forced to use the third and final Mimic Beacon. So this means when we encounter the much scarier pod of a Sectoid and two Stun Lancers, we have no Mimic Beacons left. Isn't that just great? I decide an all-out assault is the only chance we have. We need to eliminate the two Lancers at the very least. They are way too scary to let them live. Now there shouldn't be any other pods remaining on the map apart from the Warlock, so whatever run and guns we have left I'm going to activate and we're just going to charge right in there. And thanks to some crits we actually one shot both Lancers. There is so many one shots in this campaign, both by us and against us. It's really wild. And as for the Sectoid, it goes down fairly easily too, not a big problem there. Now the Warlock does activate, but he's actually used all his actions on movement so he cannot attack us. Now that's really good for us, and really, really bad for him. So we line up a 92% shot with Malorian, and we miss, because of course we do. The good news is, with his missed shot, he managed to inflict some damage on the Warlock's cover. So after a single grenade, Old Scullet Man is now exposed and vulnerable. It takes literally every action we have, but the team is able to bring this psionic menace down yet again. He's having a pretty bad run here. We then grab the vial and we head on home. And when we arrive home, we have our first lieutenant. We can choose Killer Instinct, which grants plus 50% damage to critical hits for the rest of the turn when Run and Gun is activated. There's also Stun Gunner, which increases the Arc Thrower's chance to hit. And finally, Fortify, which grants plus 20 defense for the rest of the turn, but it doesn't cost an action to activate. All three of these abilities sound really good. Soon it's time for the next retaliation mission, and a couple of weird things happen on this one. The first is that there's no mutons. I don't think I've ever experienced that before. Normally they always spawn on the second retaliation mission. And the second weird thing is the way this sectoy just completely ignores our Mimic Beacon. That's not cool. I guess the game is getting sick of me cheesing these things already. Well, newsflash game, I'm going to cheese them a heck of a lot more before this run is over. And then we get discovered by the Hunter UFO. I think we're still in May when this happens, so very early into the run. And the terrain on this one is really weird. It's got that hill that I've become accustomed to at this point, but on the other side of the hill isn't the usual flat plain with a building. Instead, it's a trench followed by another elevated area. And because of this weird arrangement of the tiles, we have to move almost on top of the disruptor in order to destroy it. And when we move up, we of course activate this pod that's containing a berserker. And the problem we have here is that reinforcements are dropping down on us, so I can't devote as much attention to the berserker pod as I would like to. See, the thing is, because we're using shotguns, the advantage is in our favor when we engage at close range. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll stop. But the point stands, it is true. The closer we are to the enemy, the more the fight is in our favor. So staying on top of where the reinforcements are dropping in from is our best bet at dealing with them. And this means I don't want to move the rest of the squad to go and deal with the berserker. I want them to stay where they are. And it's true, some of our soldiers are wielding rifles or SMGs, which would be more viable at longer distance, but the majority of them have shotguns. The class is built around using shotguns, so of course that's what I'm going to equip them with. And this leads to our troops on the front line getting into a bit of trouble. The Berserker just has too much health, and we're not going to be able to defeat it this turn. So here I decide our best bet is to use the Arc Thrower with Moby, and we get a massive stun for three actions. 
This Berserker's next turn is now completely gone. Now earlier when we stunned an enemy, it was only for a single action, so I'm not sure what the difference is now. I think this is the first mission where we're fielding level 2 arc throwers, so that's probably the reason our stuns are more effective. Either that or we just got really unlucky on the black side, or maybe mechanical enemies get stunned for less actions, I'm not entirely sure. But whatever the case, we can finally deal with the Berserker and the Disruptor on the next turn, and then we can start retreating. And getting back to the Avenger also proves to be a pain, because see, when we're retreating, we want to put space between us and the enemies. But like I just said before, our guns are at their most effective when we get close and personal. So it's a bit of a catch-22. Do we run away and make our weapons less useful, or do we stay and fight and not make any ground towards our objective? Thankfully, with our last Mimic Beacon, I'm able to stall the Advent Forces for a turn, and this gives us just enough time for everyone to make it back to the Avenger safely. These early game Mimic Beacons really saved our hides on this one. This mission would have been much more difficult without them. And thanks to that unexpected interruption, the majority of our troops are tired for the next outing. So instead, I'm forced to send some low-level soldiers. And the man himself, Cannon Fodder, has returned for this one. He's finally back. And I don't think I mentioned it, but we got an early game scanning reward for rookies, so we have plenty of troops at our disposal. I've been gradually training them up into assaults during the course of the campaign. And these low levels are clearly eager to impress. They just hand out one shot after one shot, annihilating Advent. This is really a sight to behold. And the highlight is probably Volpez not only landing a 73% shot, but also making the 10% crit chance and one-shotting the mech she fired at. And that wasn't a slug shot either, she doesn't know that ability, that was just a regular shot. Not only did she make the insanely difficult crit, but she also rolled high enough damage to take that thing out through its armor. Now we would have been fine even if the mech did survive there, but that was still really cool. And here's another annoying thing about having the base defense so early. Once that mission has been completed, your supply raids can be replaced with UFO raids. And UFO raids are generally a more difficult mission type, and we're having to engage with them very early in this run. But the truth is, it actually kind of suits our assaults. Once we're inside the UFO, the fighting becomes pretty close and tight within the corridors of the ship, and that actually serves our assaults pretty well. Even the Warlock showing up isn't much of a problem for us. These guys are taking care of business. Now after the mission, we finally have a Captain. Our abilities are Extra Conditioning, which reduces the cooldown of Run and Gun by one turn. Aggression gives us plus five to our crit chance for every enemy in sight, up to a maximum of plus 30. And Formidable grants two bonus points of HP, and 50% less damage from explosions. It's kind of like blast padding, just not as terrible. I'm giving Malorian here the same build as Moby, trying to maximize his crit chance and his crit damage, so we're gonna go with aggression. And before too long, we've constructed the training center, and once I start putting extra abilities on these guys, things are gonna get really, really bad for Advent. You think our troops are powerful now? Just you wait. But I do want to hold off on the extra abilities for the most part for now, until we have at least one kernel and I know what all of the available perks are. This way I can make sure I'm choosing the best abilities for our troops. And I do take the time to retrain Vuldra to remove Trench Gun. I rarely ever retrain soldiers, but Trench Gun seems like a pretty bad perk, so I'm eager to get rid of it. Then we have a Covert Op and Andrew gets promoted to our first Major. And the abilities here are just ridiculous. Hit and Run grants us an extra action once per turn if we eliminate a flanked enemy with our primary weapon. Yeah, every turn we can get an extra action. Very powerful. Then we have Rapid Fire, which works the same as the vanilla game. And finally, Close Encounters, which acts just like Hit and Run, except instead of a flanked enemy, we get an extra action for defeating an enemy within four tiles. It doesn't matter if they're flanked or not. Now, I'm not sure if both Hit and Run and Close Encounters stack, 
but that's probably something we need to find out before the end of this video, that's what I'm thinking. Now the next Gorilla Op is going to be our first mission in the Hunter's Territory, so he's going to appear in combat. I decide to check out his strengths and weaknesses before we deploy on the mission, and what I see is... <laughs> yeah, and mark my words, this man is about to have a very, very bad day. And his strengths are pretty interesting. Regeneration, Revenge, and Beastmaster. Now Beastmaster lets him summon savage allies, and that can include Faceless. So this may give us some opportunity to farm even more faceless corpses, because we don't have enough Mimic Beacons already, am I right? We also have another thing going for us on this one. Malorian is now rocking blue screen rounds. So our chance of critting this flanked Spectre is not only 125%, but when we do crit, we inflict a ridiculous 24 points of damage. Now when we engage the Hunter, I place a couple of troops together, I'm hoping to bait his stun grenade. Now that may sound like a horrible strategy, but hear me out. The grenade won't inflict any HP damage, and in order for the Hunter to deploy it, he's going to have to move in nice and close to our troops, at which point we'll have another soldier waiting to obliterate him. But see, the Hunter, he's too smart, he doesn't take the bait, and instead he targets our boy Chainsaw Turkey, who is isolated from the rest of the squad in the second floor of the building. Now, I was somewhat prepared for this, as Headbanger can reach the second floor and lob a grenade. This sends the Hunter tumbling down to the first floor, and that puts him right in the middle of the rest of our squad. And even better, we can activate Run and Gun on Malorian for that 50% buff to our critical damage. And once again, it is an absurd 24 damage shot, and that ends the Hunter right there. Yeah, the brittle weakness will do that to you. See you later, Hunter. Now, we do still have a few enemies to mop up, including a Faceless that the Hunter summoned. Turkey is bleeding, and he's almost out of HP, so I evac him out to keep him alive, and the rest of the squad sticks around to finish off the enemies. And they really have no trouble doing that. This one went very well. We do have some bad news, though. Turkey is wounded for 29 days. Now, I should probably build an infirmary pretty soon, but even though that's what I should do, I actually go for a lab instead. Now, I rarely use labs because they're honestly not very good, but these soldiers are very powerful, and I suspect they're going to be ready to finish the campaign before our research is finished. So if we can speed that research up, that's going to be in our favor. And besides that, even the low-level troops can hold their own pretty decently, so having soldiers out injured for an extended period of time isn't too big of a problem for us. At least that's my theory heading into the next mission. See, I'm wanting to hit the Warlock's base pretty shortly after this Haven defense, so that means sending in low-level troops to keep our A-team for the Stronghold Assault. And things start off just fine, but they very quickly go pear-shaped when three pods all activate at pretty much the same time. We've got three Berserkers and five Mutons to deal with. I guess the game is making up for not having any Mutons on the previous defense mission. And on top of that, there's still a Faceless out there somewhere. And I can honestly say this was the first time in the whole run where I was genuinely expecting defeat. And it actually had nothing to do with sending low-level troops. Even our A-team would struggle in this situation. We just got really, really bad luck. So how did the team go? Well, let's take a look. Joker is able to take down a Muton, but in the process, he activates a Faceless. So we just traded one enemy for another. We didn't actually make any progress. Now Drifter finishes another Muton, so we're down to three. That's better than five, but it's still not looking amazing. And then Void Hunter connects with his Arc Pulsar, and he disables one of the Berserkers for three actions. That's really good. Leo obliterates the Faceless in one hit. Also really good. Then we deploy another Mimic Beacon with Volpez, and then Cannon Fodder runs in to hit another Muton. Except he misses his 87% shot. That's, that's just great, Cannon Fodder. That's exactly what we need right now in this desperate situation. Now, the Berserkers are enraged, so they're ignoring the Mimic Beacon. But that being said, one of them was at full health earlier in the mission, and it also ignored a Mimic Beacon. 
So I really have no idea what's going on at this point. That sectoid ignored one earlier as well, so the game just kind of seems a bit broken. Now the mutons do thankfully target the beacon like they're supposed to, and that's really the main thing. The berserkers I'm not as worried about. The problem, however, is that was the last Mimic Beacon we had, so there's no more Meme Cheese. And on the next turn, I know we're still not going to be able to defeat all the Mutons, so we are going to take some casualties. I decide the next best bet is to flashbang the Mutons. This will at least stop them from lobbing a grenade into the middle of the civilians, so we can at least minimise the casualties we're going to take, even if we can't prevent them entirely. So we wipe out one Muton and one Berserker, and we stun the downed Berserker for another three actions, so it's not doing anything anytime soon. We lose two more civilians on the enemy turn, but the Resistance do help us in whittling down the alien's HP. And so finally, after three turns of dealing with these clowns, we're able to defeat all of them. And the crazy thing is, as bad as this seemed, our troops didn't actually take any damage from these horrible pod activations. We did, however, lose way more civilians than we otherwise would have. Still, the mission was a success, and that's what counts. That could have been much, much worse for us there. And this trend of barely making it out unharmed continues for several more missions. Like this resistance mission, just look at the sheer amount of enemies that we are facing down here. Or this guerrilla op, where we have, I think, every single enemy on the map active at once. They all just decided to cluster around the device that we have to protect. Now it's good strategy, that's what I would do if I were Advent, don't get me wrong, but it makes our life difficult. And here I get to talk about a mechanic that doesn't really come up much. See how these final two mutons aren't attacking us, they're just running around pointlessly? That's actually intentional. On every difficulty, except for Legendary, if you have too many enemies active at once, the game will deliberately have some of them leave you alone. Now, the exact number of enemies that you need to trigger before this happens varies by difficulty level, but the fact that it's happening at all means that we're overwhelmed here. And the only thing that has kept us safe is our army of Mimic Beacons. Without those things, we would be in huge trouble. As it stands, we do get through it okay. And after the mission, Moby has a promotion and I decide to give him the formidable perk. I figure this way he can stand adjacent to sector pods and gatekeepers to maximise his crit chance, while also not taking too much damage when they blow up in his face. Literally. And as things continue getting tougher on the tactical layer, the strategic layer begins tightening the squeeze on us as well. See, I'd love to hit the Warlock's base, but the Avatar progress is filling up, so I decide the Forge mission needs to be the priority right now. And of course, we activate the first pod and the sector pod at the same time. Now we focus on the pod of regular enemies to get rid of them, but the sector pod isn't going down this turn. See, because it doesn't use cover, we can't actually flank it. And this means we don't get the crit chance bonus for flanking. It doesn't make too much sense realistically, but Vigia games are gonna Vigia. Now as usual, a Mimic Beacon saves our hides, we can then finish the sector pod on the next turn, and I did miss an important detail here. See how Moby has that bonus 2 HP? Yeah, Formidable actually gives two points of ablative HP. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And what that means is that it essentially acts as a shield. So if he loses those two points of HP on a mission, he won't actually be injured until his HP proper starts going down. So a slight correction there, but I've already recorded that earlier part of the video, and recording these scripts once is annoying enough. I'm not gonna go back and do it again because that's the type of content creator I am. You may call it laziness. I, however, call it efficiency. Anyway, let's move on. Now, things get real bad as we move on to the bridge. See, we activate one pod that we're too far out of position to deal with. So I use another meme beacon to buy us time to push forward, because remember, Bradford's favorite tactic is the way to go on this run. But as we push forward on the next turn, we activate an even scarier pod. 
Now, often there'll be a small number of people on any video that I make that criticize something that I've done during the run. And sometimes that criticism is valid, sometimes it's not. But in this situation, oh yeah, I deserve to be criticized. Despite having multiple soldiers with lightning reflexes, I opt to run the Heavy Mech's Overwatch with Chainsaw Turkey who doesn't have lightning reflexes. And as a result, we almost lose him. He's down to 1 HP. And we've seen these mechs inflict as much as 12 damage with a single hit in the past. So this was a really horrible move by me. I think in my head, for some inexplicable reason, I temporarily thought lightning reflexes worked like Shadow Step, that it wouldn't activate the Overwatch at all. But that's completely wrong. It does activate the Overwatch, so there was no reason to think that. I guess I'm just losing my mind. And I also discover here that yes, the Arc Thrower does work differently on mechs than organic targets. Mechs will take damage and be stunned for one action. Organics take no damage, but they'll be stunned for three actions. So that's good to know. And you know the drill by now, we're in a tough situation, and thanks to our Mimic Beacons, our soldiers are spared a horrifying end. I heal Turkey with our one medikit, and we head into the main facility. Now inside the building, the Hunter is able to use tracking shot through the walls, so that's a pretty impressive, if broken, skill. But it's ultimately us who have the last laugh. See, coming into the building means that he's been baited into a fight at point-blank range. And given he's a sniper, and we're wielding shotguns, plus remember his brittle weakness, yeah, it doesn't take a long time to finish him off. He really should have stayed outside on the roof where he at least had a chance of hurting us. Now, Archons are appearing by this point, and if we can't Alpha Strike them, we want to stun them with the Arc Thrower. If they're able to fly up into the air, hitting them with our low aim assault units is going to be a nightmare. But despite these guys being annoying and they're now being deployed on the field, we still make it through this mission without any further injuries. So victory achieved and the avatar progress has been slowed. But even though it's been slowed, it's still pretty high overall. So I decide we need to start expanding to new regions. We have the Continental Bonus that lets us do it instantly, and we have a plethora of intel, so I could have done this at any time. The main reason I've been holding off is I want to avoid having a third Chosen to deal with, but we're out of time, so I press on, we've got no choice. And here we can see the Assassin's strengths are Low Profile, Brutal, and Mech Lord. And her weakness is Bewildered. Now the aim stat on most of our soldiers sucks as it is, so having her with low profile is going to be pretty brutal for us. All we can do is do our best, and hopefully we'll be alright. And in seemingly no time at all, as in we haven't even had another mission, the Avatar progress is already full again. Now we're about two days away from being able to Skulljack a Codex, which would reduce it, but the next mission, a UFO raid, is available right now. So we can't afford to wait two days as that mission will vanish. So I'm faced with a dilemma here. Do I hit the Psionic Gate mission or do I hit an Advent Facility? What's the better way to reduce the Avatar progress? The Gate mission means Chrysalids and the Assassin, but a Facility means an Alien Ruler. Now my usual strategy for rulers is to cheese them from beyond line of sight. But apart from grenades, our assaults don't really have any way of doing that. And fighting rulers up close and personal sounds like a really, really bad idea. So I opt for the gate mission, and you'll see here, the only enemies are chrysalids. A whole map of chrysalids. Well, plus the assassin. That is awful. So I decide we're definitely going to need some battle scanners for this one. And then you'll notice another problem. I haven't completed the Advent Trooper Autopsy, so there's no way to build scanners. And I can't even see if an instant autopsy is available because we're in the middle of a Shadow Chamber project and those cannot be paused. So we're going into the Assassin and 13 Chrysalids with no battle scanners. I opt instead to build a bunch of medikits, these should prevent our soldiers from taking poison damage, 
but they don't always work properly, so they could be a total waste of time. I've also loaded up on Mimic Beacons, as we're definitely going to need those, and we've got a couple of blue screen rounds. And the biggest issue here is that all those medi kits mean we only have space for a single grenade, so we're not going to be doing a lot of shred damage to that gatekeeper. I'll be honest here, this is probably the worst loadout I've ever taken on this mission, and it's probably going to be a disaster. There is a little bit of good news though, we do have level 3 SMGs now, so that's something, I guess. Now we do get some genuinely good luck here, which is really good because we're going to need it. There's a trench just before the psionic gate, and this makes it pretty easy to determine that the burrowed chrysalids are on the other side of the trench. So we know where they are, we can plan around them at least a little bit. So I try something that I'm not even sure if it's going to work, but given how desperate we are and how bad our equipment is, I figure it's worth a try. I toss a Mimic Beacon to the other side of the trench to see if it lures out the lids, and it does. Just about all the burrowed chrysalids rise to the surface to attack this thing on their turn. And look at this, it's here I'm wishing I brought more grenades. Those things are all clustered together and we could do big damage to so many of them. Sadly, that's not going to happen. And what's even more sad is that the assassin decides to appear right at this exact moment. So now we have almost a whole map of chrysalids that we just woke up, plus the assassin to deal with at the same time. So this is looking horrible. Now we do still have some Mimic Beacons that we can use to distract the Chrysalids, so I decide let's just focus on the Assassin this turn, and if we can wipe her out, we may have a chance at surviving. Well, unfortunately, Bismarck misses an 88% shot, so any chance we had of taking her out this turn has pretty much vanished right there. This is a horrible time to be missing such an easy attack. But hey, I'm playing XCOM, I gotta expect this stuff, right? So may our valiant Mimic Defenders protect us in this time of peril. The lids swarm our holographic boys as you would expect, and one even attacks Valdra. But the interesting thing here is actually the Assassin. She doesn't attack us, she just moves. She doesn't attack at all, and she doesn't even move very far. Now remember how those Mutons didn't attack us on that earlier mission because there were too many active enemies? I think the same thing is happening here, and because the Chosen always act last, the game is determining she has to leave us alone because of the sheer volume of enemies that we're facing down. So we can eliminate her this turn easily enough, and she's gone, that's good, but we have a bigger issue. And that issue is the legion of chrysalids that are still coming for our throats. So we use our final Mimic Beacon, but that's only going to protect us for so long. And once it goes down, sure enough, Drifter takes a hit. Now come our next turn, we do reduce their numbers significantly, but there's still quite a few of them active. And Drifter has enough HP that he might survive one more attack, but not two. And there's two chrysalids right in front of us, still drawing breath. So I do the only thing that I can think to do, I go for a clutch 73% stun with the Arc Thrower. And it connects, that may have just saved Drifty Boy's life, thank goodness. Um, never mind, the other Chrysalid that's not stunned just runs away. So that's better than attacking, I'm happy about it, I'm just not sure what it's doing, I guess it's falling back to reinforcements? Whatever, we hunt it down on the next turn, and we eradicate it. Now, I could move forward and activate the Gatekeeper, but I decide to hold off. See, if there are no other enemies on the map, any burrowed chrysalids will usually start coming to the surface to attack. Now, it doesn't happen 100% of the time, but it does happen most of the time. So by just staying where we are, we can bait out any remaining bugs and send them to the Shadow Realm. But once that's done, eventually we do have to face off against the Gatekeeper. And we've used our one and only grenade on that cluster of chrysalids, so we can't even shred this thing. And here is where the aim of our assaults is a real handicap to us. We've been buffing Darkhawk's aim with Covert Ops, a PCS, and a scope, so he can hit just about anything. 
but the rest of these troops are about as accurate as Mr. Magoo. Now the basic strat is to use some of the soldiers to spam attacks with the arc thrower, and then with the rest of our soldiers who are shooting, hope that just through sheer long run proportion, we'll eventually land enough of these difficult shots to end this thing before all of those stuns wear off. And it takes a while, but the strategy works, and sure enough, we bring this behemoth down. Now, given how poorly prepared I was for that mission, I'm genuinely shocked that everyone made it out alive. That could have easily been a run ender right there. Now, armored opponents are becoming a bit of a problem, so I think we need to get powered armor as quickly as possible. That way we can start building some war suits and some heavy weapons. If we can be using blaster launchers and treadstorm cannons, their tactical layer should become a lot easier. At least that's what I'm hoping. Now by the time I get around to hitting the Warlock's base, we don't have powered armor, but we have got storm guns, so our assaults are going to be outputting even higher damage than they were, as absurd as that may sound. And after surviving that previous mission, I'm feeling pretty confident about this one. If we can get through that, I reckon we can get through anything. So I decide to bring the Skulljack and we're going to use it on a codex. And while confidence does play a part in it, the truth is the Avatar project is still a big problem for us and we need to be bringing down the progress. Just to put things into perspective, we haven't received a single covert op to reduce the buildup of the Avatar project the entire campaign. So it really is becoming a problem, even though we literally just reduced it on the gate mission. Now my biggest fear with this scenario was that the Avatar would teleport into a totally different room after we attacked it. That would make it impossible for us to take it out in one turn. It's only supposed to teleport to tiles that it has line of sight on, but this is XCOM, so I'm not going to trust that that's actually what this thing is going to do. Thankfully though, it does stay in this room, which is great, as the meme lord himself can inflict one of those big crits and not finish it off. Huh. Now the reason we didn't do as much damage there as we normally do with those meme lord crits is because I didn't activate run and gun, so he's not getting the extra critical damage. It's no big deal though, as Dark Hawk is in prime position to finish the Avatar off, and we've dealt with it. It's gone fairly easily. Let's hope the Warlock is as equally as straightforward. Now the pod in the final chamber is a Viper, and our first Andromedon. It's a bit of a weird pod, and I don't think I've mentioned it, but Slugshot seems to benefit from all our perks that buff crit chance and damage. So behold Headbanger one-shotting a first form Andromedon. See Headbanger, I told you this was going to be a good one, even if it's not Long War 2. But you know what's not good? I move a single tile further forward with Moby than I did with Headbanger. And this one tile is the difference maker to activate the Warlock. So now he's here way too soon. I'm not ready to deal with this guy just yet. So I decide I'm just going to stick to the original plan, I'll focus on the regular enemies, we want to take them out as quickly as we can, and we one-shot them all. I mean, technically it was two for the Andromedon, one for the first form and one for the second, but you know what I mean. I then use Run and Gun with basically the whole squad to move in as close as possible on the Warlock, and I want to hit him with as much damage as possible. So not having our run and guns for later could be a massive problem, but I figure Future Drifter can deal with that. It's his problem, it's not mine, right? What could go wrong? Now the Warlock for his part summons only a single Stun Lancer. I really would have expected more by this stage in the game. Now he also dazes a couple of our troops, but we can deal with that. Really the worst thing that he's done is he's retreated into full cover. And we have no run and guns to reach him. Yeah, I guess I'm Future Drifter, and Past Drifter really did me dirty on this one. That didn't take long. We do get lucky here, as Malorian lands are 56% shot for an absurd 10 damage. That's enough to send Skullet Boy back into his safe space, and he summons his Spectral Stun Lancers. 
The Lancers are easy one shots and then Malorian hits the Warlock again, finishing him off. And I accidentally built an EMP grenade earlier. I meant to build blue screen rounds, but I clicked on the wrong thing. And then once I had built it, I figured I might as well bring it on this mission because it's gonna do good damage to the sarcophagus it did in the last run. But I've made a miscalculation. See, unlike in the last run where we had upgraded our grenades in the proving ground, in this run we haven't. So our EMP does pretty pathetic damage. So we're not gonna be able to take out the revival device this turn, unfortunately. The reinforcements are a Spectre and an Andromedon, but I ignore them and I just wanna smash that sarcophagus into pieces. And we take it out with actions to spare and Andro goes for the Spectre. And I made another mistake earlier in the video. See, hit and run as well as close encounters don't actually require you to eliminate an enemy to activate. They just give you a free action the first time you shoot at a flanked or nearby enemy. So these abilities are even better than I thought. So the Spectre goes down quite easily and a Mean Beacon can distract the Andromedon. And then the Warlock returns, but I actually opt to deal with the Andromedon first. I don't need to, but our assaults are leveling up quite slowly, so we want any XP we can get. And the Warlock, let's face it, he's been pretty much a joke this entire run. It's not like finishing him off is going to be a difficult task. In fact, it's pretty easy. Embarrassingly easy, actually. So that's chosen number one down. Really good progress for us. And after a couple more missions, we have our first Colonel, thanks to a promotion via Covert Ops. We can choose Bring It On, which adds plus one crit damage for every two enemies we can see, up to a maximum of eight. So imagine having 16 enemies on the map at once to max out this perk. That's a pretty horrifying thought, but I think it's not that uncommon in Long War 2. Then there's also Close Combat Specialist. This allows a free reaction shot against any enemy within four tiles that moves or fires. And we've also got Untouchable, and that works just like the vanilla version of the perk. They're good abilities for sure, but I actually think the major perks are better, which is a little bit weird. By the next Gorilla Op, not only do we have Powered Armor, we also have the Resistance Order that lets us build Wraith Suits and War Suits instantly. So we're rocking some of those, plus Darkhawk has the Warlock's Rifle, and he picked up Shred as a hidden ability. So yeah, this mission goes about as well for Advent as you would expect it to. Now we do actually take a hit, but that's only because I'm playing super recklessly. If I had been more conservative and made better use of the Mimic Beacons, this would have been an easy flawless. I just figured I could afford to take the risk. And I could, so it worked out. Then we finally get a covert op to sabotage the Avatar project. It only took until August, but better late than never. 
And then we have a council mission and the hunter is on this one. And I do something really silly. I cluster all of my troops together. Now, of course, that's when the hunter activates and he lobs that stun grenade right into us, hitting four of our troops, but not before he summoned two faceless, of course. Now, this may seem like a terrible situation, but it's really not. See, I clustered the troops together, not because I wasn't thinking, but because I just didn't care. See, with his brittle weakness, the hunter is pretty much a pushover. I don't need to worry about this guy. And do you remember how I was curious as to whether hit and run and close encounters could both trigger at once? Well, I'm happy to confirm that they can. I gave Moby both abilities and we can trigger them both on the one turn. Now this gives us some nice options like being able to shoot, reload and shoot again, or possibly shoot, move and shoot again. But I'm thinking with some real skill, you could probably get them to activate one at a time on the same turn, allowing three shots in one turn. But let's face it, I'm probably not gonna have the patience to set up something that cool. Now it is kind of crazy here, the hunter survives two blasts from Moby. Again, if we had activated run and gun, that wouldn't have happened, but it's fine. We're still able to wipe out him and his retinue in a single turn, and that was with four of our soldiers getting stun bombed. That was just a beatdown. The RNG really was not on the hunter's side in this campaign. However, however, pride cometh before the fall, and the next mission goes real sideways, real fast. Things start off pretty horribly when the enemy pod patrols into us and blows our concealment. Now, thankfully, they don't shoot at us, especially because one of them was an Andromedon, but another pod activates at the same time. So we're facing off against two Andromedons, and I mess up when I use Void Hunter instead of Moby on one of those Andromedon second forms. See, Moby's the one with blue screen rounds, so I wanted to attack with him, I just didn't realize I had the wrong person selected. So instead I decide we'll still utilize the blue screen rounds and we'll go and get the Spectre. And in doing that, we activate a third pod. I just keep making things worse here. So needless to say, we need a mean beacon to bail us out. But one mean beacon may not be enough. Cannon fodder is also gonna get to live up to his namesake by drawing enemy fire. Now luckily he has the fortify ability which can be used to increase his defense. So advent's attacks miss our boy. Cannon fodder lives, for now. And the big problem here is that the captain has marked him and I really don't want that. So I send cannon fodder in to take that captain out. And of course that triggers a fourth pod. And this one has a sector pod and a heavy mech. This is actually terrible. Now we have got plenty of mean beacons that we can use, but every soldier that uses one foregoes an attack. So we can't just stall with beacons forever. Eventually we have to fight back against this army that we're facing off against. So I used three mimic beacons on this turn and that means we've only got one left. And I decide at this point, the best course of action is just to destroy the device, prevent the dark event and just evac out. We'll miss out on the mission reward, but that's okay if it means keeping our troops alive. The problem is the Drifter is just a little too far away, so we're stuck here for at least one more turn. Now, full transparency, I do misclick while I'm trying to waypoint Malorian around the path of acid that the Andromedon has left, so I reload the turn. And reloading actually makes things worse because the second time around, Moby does less damage to the Sector Pod. So that's just terrific. That's just what I need right now. So on the top level, we eliminate or stun everything except for the heavy mech. Well, there is a purifier too, but it can't hurt our final mimic beacon, so I'm not counting that. And then I decide I'll stand Chainsaw Turkey at the top of the ladder to keep the Advent Bros in the sewer at bay. This should stop the Lancer and Andromedon shell from being able to climb up and melee us, or at least it would, if not for the fact that I've completely forgotten there are other ladders and guttering that the bad guys can use to climb up. So yeah, we're getting meleeed this turn. Now Chainsaw does have an ability that makes the first attack against him a guaranteed dodge, so that's really good and the Lancer doesn't knock him out. Can you even get knocked out if you dodged the attack? 
I'm not actually sure. Does anyone in the comment section know? But anyway, what's not so lucky is that a purifier lobs a fire grenade at us. So even though everyone is alive right now, we have three guys with lost HP and three guys who are currently on fire. So the sensible approach is to destroy the device and evac out. The dark event was the main priority on this one, so that's what I'm most concerned about. Now we do finish as many enemies as we can on the way out. We're doing that partly for XP and partly just because these guys are jerks and I want to take them out if I can. So everybody makes it out and that was the toughest mission that we faced in quite a while. Maybe the whole campaign. But it's okay because things are already starting to turn around. We complete some research for plus one damage on our beam weapons and we get access to level three arc throwers. So those two things should give us a nice power boost. And with our new buffs, we send the high rollers into the assassin's base. I'm bringing a single battle scanner for this one just to help us locate that sneaky chosen, but I think this one's gonna go okay. At least I hope so. We'll just jump straight to the final chamber because this video is getting long enough as it is and nothing really exciting happens in the first area. So the assassin has some chrysalids waiting for us and we annihilate them, they're no big deal. Then I end up using both charges of the battle scanner to locate the assassin. It was a 50-50 shot that I'd find her on the first one and we failed. So that kind of sucks, we don't have any charges of that thing left. However, once she's located, she goes down pretty easily and we then start unloading on the sarcophagus. I didn't bring the EMP grenade this time since our weapons are going to do more damage with just a standard shot. And check this out, Valdra uses rapid fire on the sarcophagus and of course one of the shots misses. It is uncanny how many times these special abilities miss this big stupid block of metal at least once. But I suppose that's XCOM isn't it baby? Now we end up not finishing it off on the next turn either. One of the reinforcements was a heavy mech which would potentially one shot a mimic beacon so I wanted to take that thing out and this means foregoing firepower that we could have used against the sarcophagus. Nevertheless on the next turn we finally wipe it out and we finish off all the reinforcements as well so it's just us and Lady Forehead. Step one is of course to find her and we get lucky Andrew finds her straight away. And once the assassin is found, the team moves in to take her down permanently. She didn't get to do anything to us at all this mission. And remember, the hunter is actually the weakest of the three chosen when you consider that he has brittle. So I'm not expecting that one to be much of a final showdown. These chosen have just been outclassed at this point. But anyway, moving on, Darkhawk has reached Brigadier rank. Our abilities are Street Sweeper, which is another cone-based attack with a shotgun that does extra damage to unarmored targets. And get this, it's blocked by heavy cover. So I don't think that means that you may miss if the enemy is in heavy cover, just that the enemy will straight up ignore the attack if they're behind heavy cover. And not to mention, doing extra damage to unarmored targets is a horrible idea. The targets that have armor are the ones that you want to be inflicting extra damage on. They're the most dangerous ones, and they're the ones who will have their regular damage reduced because of the armor. This ability sounds even worse than Trench Gun. The second ability, Chain Lightning, thankfully sounds way better. You fire your arc thrower at every visible enemy who is capable of being stunned, which avatars and chosen are not, just as an aside. So this ability is basically face off, but with the arc thrower. That's really cool. And lethal causes shots with our primary weapon to do plus two damage. This is awesome, especially when you combine it with being able to make multiple shots per turn and extra crit damage. That plus two damage could really stack up. Then once again, the avatar progress maxes out and it's full doomsday mode for us. I want to avoid the alien rulers at all costs since our close range units will not fare well against those things. And yeah, I know, I said I wouldn't use the meme again, but come on, it's been a while and it actually fit there. 
Anyway, I decide to hit an alien facility that will remove a single pip of Avatar progress. This means that no doubt, straight away after the mission, the progress will fill again and we'll be right back to where we were. But the truth is, we could finish the campaign right now. We've done all the story research, but I want both the Hunter gone and more max level soldiers. So we don't need to buy a lot of time, just enough to eke us over the finish line. So removing less avatar progress in order to avoid any rulers is the approach I'm going with. I think it makes the most sense. And as it turns out, that removal of one block, it actually lasts a really long time. Long enough for us to hit the hunter's base, in fact. And I'm feeling so confident about this one, I leave our two brigadiers at the base. We really just want to get as many promotions as we can, so anyone who is max level already is not going to be used unless it's an emergency until the final missions. And the team we've sent are still majors and colonels, so they're powerful enough in their own right. I'm not expecting them to struggle with this one. Now against the Hunter, we begin with a grenade to shred, and then we just start abusing hit and run and close encounters. No one shot this time, but we do wipe him out easily enough. And as usual, it's then time to worry about the sarcophagus. We can take it out reasonably quickly, we're doing big damage at this point, and the reinforcements aren't any threat to us. So time to mop up the Hunty Boy. Then once again, it doesn't take long for him to go down, now there's no Chosen left to worry about, and that's always a good feeling in these runs. So really, we're just waiting for the final promotions, and then we're going to end this campaign. And Covert Ops are our best bet to do that, so we're just doing any Covert Op that gives a promotion as a reward. Now while we're waiting, we have a Gorilla Op, and this one has the Surgical Sit Rep. That means only three troopers on the mission. For us, of course. Advent will have the same amount as they always have. And as if having only three soldiers wasn't bad enough, I decide to use a blaster bomb to kick things off, and I activate three pods at once, and one of which has a gatekeeper. Now while this may seem like a terrible idea, because it is, in my defense, these three pods are all piled right on top of the objective that we've been tasked with protecting, so I really didn't have much choice. I'm only able to deploy one Mimic Beacon against a legion of enemies, so I'm expecting to take damage. I'm hoping they're gonna target Chainsaw with his guaranteed dodge. Well, one of the Archons goes for Blazing Pinions, so that's really good, no damage there. The captain marks chainsaw, but doesn't shoot because of tactical analysis. And the gatekeeper, instead of coming at us, attacks its own allies in order to raise a single zombie. A truly big-brained play from the AI there. So somehow we got through that and we took no damage. I honestly cannot believe it. So we whittle down a few of the enemies and we deploy our final mimic beacons. But the problem is we activate a fourth pod, and this is just getting ridiculous. We've only got three guys, how are we occupying so much space to activate all these enemies at the same time? The game throws a surgical, which is already bad enough, and then it deploys all the enemies right next to each other. This sucks. So on the next turn, I decide we need to evac out, and sadly we're not going to be able to complete this objective. Our soldiers did put in a great effort, but there's just too few of us and too many of Advent. I figured losing the mission was better than losing our troops and all the XP they've accumulated. So back on the strategic layer, I keep focusing on the Covert Ops to grab those promotions, and once we have 9 Brigadiers, I set out to finish this run. And having that many Brigadiers is probably overkill, but that's what I thought about the 100 Grenades run, and we all saw how the Network Tower went there. So I'm not going to feel bad about over-preparing this time. I'm not taking any chances. Now I wasn't expecting the Network Tower to be too tough, but I forgot that we actually have the Intel bonus for a fourth soldier. And as always, having four troops on this one usually makes it really, really easy. I mean, look at this. Void Hunter is guaranteed 15 damage on this codex. And once he eliminates it, he gets another shot because it was flanked. Our soldiers have become very, very powerful. Now with the next pod, we're kind of just in a bad position so the Spectre survives. 
but all it does is create a clone, and given that it only has two HP left when it does this, that clone is not gonna be around for a very long time. So we push on to the final pod, and I take out the codex before realizing I'm just wasting my time. We can just use run and gun to hack the objective right now and bring this one to a close. We don't even need to bother with the rest of the bad guys. And now, the final hurdle. Now this is the team I'm bringing, and as you can see, they are pretty monstrous. I've equipped Andrew with the bolt caster for bigger damage output, and I've put her in a wraith suit so she's still going to be mobile. Darkhawk with the Warlock's rifle and his stupidly high aim stat also has a wraith suit, and everyone else is rocking war suits with blaster launches. Not to mention three mimic beacons and three sets of blue screen rounds. I've also spent about 200 AP giving this crew extra abilities. So this is as powerful as we can get. Let the devastation begin. Headbanger has the phantom ability, so I'm using him to scout. Of course, I move him to the right side of the map and the coast is clear. I move Malorian, who isn't concealed, to the left-hand side, and you guessed it, that's where the bad guys are. So the first pod is off to a kind of miserable start. Now thankfully Darkhawk can use Chain Lightning and he can stun the enemies that survive. This gives us plenty of time to move in closer and attack on the next turn. Now the problem is that moving to flank the remaining Muton triggers a Sector Pod. So we shred it with Darkhawk and I'm really pleased he picked up this perk. This is really useful. And then a rapid fire from Moby finishes the tin can off. The rest of the enemies in the pod aren't a problem, and we just kind of run right through them. And with all the enemies disposed of, we can scout ahead with Headbanger, as was the original plan. Now we come across a pod of Berserkers and Faceless, so that's a lot of HP for us to deal with. And no benefits from blue screen rounds. And honestly, it's pretty crazy the exchange that we have with this pod. So I figure we're just going to overwatch and we'll let them patrol into us. That'll give us a full turn to respond and deal with them. And since they're melee only, we know when they activate, they're going to move in close range. I had to squeeze it in there one more time. I couldn't help myself. I'm a monster. I know. But anyway, the squad of snacks comes in from the side looking to flank us. Now this is bad, they're gonna see Headbanger and blow his concealment. And several of these enemies try to do exactly that. They start moving in to flank Headbanger, but just look at this. The rest of the squad just mows them down before they can reach their position, keeping Headbanger nice and hidden. This was a true you shall not pass moment, and my goodness was it amazing. I love this. Now the Berserkers and Faceless, however, they're just not moving up on us, so it seems we're gonna have to go to them. And this is actually an exceptionally easy task. See, Andro has Chain Lightning, so she can just stun all of them, leaving them as roadkill and us as vultures. And we're pretty much just bullying Advent at this point. They really can't do much to us. And it seems Advent is feeling the same way, because they get really sick and tired of our nonsense. I'm scouting with Headbanger and he stumbles right into four mutons. Apparently all of them were hidden behind this single pillar. I'm not buying it, game. I think he should have been able to see at least one of them, but whatever. We do lose our concealment and that really sucks, but things get even worse when a second pod featuring two gatekeepers also activates. So I end up burning through two out of our three Mimic Beacons in a single turn. It's really not what I wanted, but it's still preferable to taking damage. And it only occurs to me, as these Gatekeepers are activated, that I haven't brought any Medikits. So I'm sure we'll be fine, right? Well, no. No, we're not going to be fine, because things get even better on the enemy turn when another pod with some Archons activates. Yeah, the game is throwing all it has at me here, and honestly, with how powerful our troops are, I can't say I blame it. And then, get this, we wipe them all out on our next turn. Yeah, the Gatekeepers, the Codexes, the Mutons, the Archons, they all get sent to the Shadow Realm in a single turn. And the highlight is probably Chainsaw with Rapid Fire, it's a 45% chance to hit, so I'm banking on at least one shot connecting and doing some good damage. 
And that's precisely what happens. He lands the first shot, inflicts a crit, and obliterates the gatekeeper with a 25 damage hit. He didn't even need the second shot. And Headbanger, he also lands both of his 65% rapid fire shots. We got really, really lucky this turn. We went from really bad luck with all the enemies activating to really good luck with taking them out. And we did have the final Mimic Beacon in reserve in case we needed it if we couldn't destroy all the enemies this turn, but we didn't. Wow, this was amazing. Now as we head into the final chamber, I was hoping Headbanger would still be concealed and he could launch our first attack on the Avatar, but sadly the Mutons have ruined that plan. So instead, I just drop a blaster bomb on the whole pod. Now it always spawns in the same place, so hitting it from outside line of sight is easy enough to do. Malorian then finishes the Avatar with another stupidly powerful crit, and the rest of the team then gets to work mopping up the Archons and then getting into position for the impending reinforcements. And look at these codexes running right into Moby's close combat specialist Overwatch trap. I just stood him there and waited for the bad guys to come. Now Moby's doing a minimum of 12 damage, meaning he can one-shot codexes without blue screen rounds. This man is a bad operator. Now on the other side of the room we have some Mutons. Andrew is able to Chain Lightning stun the two that we haven't finished off. Now I probably could have taken them down permanently this turn, but I wanted to focus on moving forward to get our soldiers into better position to deal with the reinforcements when they turn up. So stunning will be just fine for now. And speaking of reinforcements, here comes Avatar number two. And I actually pull off the thing here. I take one shot at the flanked Muton in the retinue to gain a free shot from hit and run. Then I blast the Avatar at point blank range to get another free action from close encounters. I got both of them to trigger in one turn on separate shots. This is great. I was really proud of myself about this. Now the Avatar tries teleporting away, but Headbanger hunts it down without mercy and a slug shot takes that sucker down. I then use Rapid Fire with Moby, and this means he can fire four times total in a single turn. This is absurd. Now unfortunately he misses both Rapid Fire shots, so it's kind of anticlimactic, but it was still a cool idea in theory, at least I think so. Now meanwhile, I want to take out the last Muton with Malorian, and sadly while I was playing the game I started having a sneezing fit, and this caused me to misclick, so I ended up totally wasting Moby's turn. Now, I really couldn't be bothered reloading the turn, so instead I just send Chainsaw in to save the day. I think we should still be okay when the final Avatar arrives, at least hopefully, and it's only now looking back at the footage that I think we actually stunned the Muton for four actions anyway, so I could have just completely ignored it. But, oh well, you can't change these things, can you? Now Moby is able to avoid the first Archon's attack thanks to Untouchable, but the second one connects. Now thankfully between his Ablative HP and his Armor Points, he hasn't taken too much damage. We do need to clear this side of the room though, and that's not going to be too easy since three Codex has just arrived. Unless... Yes, Darkhawk, use the power of your Chain Lightning. He stuns the entire left side of the room, so Moby doesn't have to worry about taking any more damage for now. Now on the other side, some Vipers have deployed, but they have such low HP that they're not much of a threat. We can easily wipe them out. And then here it is, the final boss. We use Andro's Grappling Hook to move in real close and hit the Avatar. This causes it to teleport, but I deliberately left Headbanger on top of the central pillar in the middle of the room for this very scenario. He's close enough to move in and fire, but unfortunately he only scores a dodge. So the Avatar teleports again, this time right on top of Moby, and this actually causes his close combat specialist reaction fire to trigger. Now I wasn't expecting that, but the Avatar gets hit and teleports away immediately. And this was pretty funny. It was like this thing took one look at Moby and just noped out of there. So the Avatar teleports again, and by this point, it has literally reached the opposite corner of the chamber. It has moved as far as it possibly can. But see, the thing is, there's no respite for the Wicked here. 
Darkhawk, thanks to his grapple, is in prime position to deliver the finishing blow. And there you have it, we've beaten the game with only assaults. And we did it using the power of Close Range. Close Range. Close Range. Close Range. Close Range. Okay, I'm sorry you had to witness that. It was my first attempt in my life at mixing music. And let's be honest, it will probably be my last. So for better or worse, you've just witnessed history, even if you wish you hadn't. But more seriously, this was a crazy run. And I know it may have looked easy, and the end game was certainly a beatdown on Advent, but the mid game actually saw us getting into multiple precarious situations. If we hadn't have picked up those extra Mimic Beacons early on thanks to that supply raid, this run would have been far more difficult. Those things got us out of quite a few tight spots. But anyway, that'll do it from me. So thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, please consider the usual things of liking the video, commenting and subscribing, it really helps out the channel. And I'll be back with another video soon, until then, have a great day.